our weekly live stream where we live stream every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern and uh, right here from the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. And we've done this for a little over five years now. Um, occasionally, we'll live stream on a Saturday or Sunday evening, and we call that Cocktails with the Critters. Those are a lot of fun as well, uh, but you can always find um, the, you can always find what we do um, on our events page. Um, and that's here on our Facebook page. Uh, let me get that pulled up for you right here. Um, so every Coffee with the Critters that we have and every other event that we have, we post on our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. We also post that here on our, our events page here in um, on our Facebook page. Good morning, Eva and Shelly and Maggie and Christy and Bobby and people are starting to come in. Thank you. Um, you can also find um, more of what we do by signing up to our email newsletter. Um, and you can find that. You can join that here on our Facebook page as well. We've got a special guest on today, Jen Hirakawa from Kawa Farms. Um, I've known Jen for, we'll talk about that when I bring her on, uh, but I've reached out and asked her to be a guest with me this morning. Um, she has she has a long list of things that she does and she does it very well and she's uh, pretty unique. But um, I just want to share before I bring her on, I want to share a couple of things that um, have happened this past week. Um, professional dog trainer uh, Vicki Ronchetti did a live live stream interviewed me this past Monday um, at 5 p.m. Eastern. You can find that on her Facebook page, Show Dog Prep School. I believe I also shared it to our page. So there's a lot of things happening. And my weekly jobs I do just got a lot busier. Um, so I was in meetings last night and didn't get home until 9 p.m. Um, a couple of things that are coming up. Um, you'll see life is going to, I don't want to say starting to get back to normal, um, but things are starting to happen. Um, so anyways, you guys may have seen in my, the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page this past week, I did a visit back out to the zoo. Um, as of next week, I'm going to start going back to the zoo on a regular basis and um, you'll be seeing a lot of the work that we do. If you are a level two member, that is where I live stream all my work with the zoo animals. Um, so last night I had the pleasure of the first time ever feeding this baby camel right here, which was at the time less than 12 hours old. Um, the mother wasn't feeding at the time. Um, this camel is gonna be reunited with its mother. I don't know, I'm not the expert there. Um, here within the next day or two, I believe. So I had the honor last night of bottle feeding it. And that was very interesting. Um, also had the honor of seeing this uh, baby wallaby um, being bottle fed. Uh, its mother passed away um, from uh, a type of cancer in the mouth and the baby was pulled. The veterinarian has been helping taking care of it. And um, he's He's getting pretty big. So you'll be seeing more about him um, in the very near future. So with that being said, I told Jen, after you see the baby wallaby, we are bringing you on screen. You ready, Jen? Okay. Bringing her in now in one second. There we go. So here's Jen Hirakawa um, with Kawa Farms in Iowa. Um. <sighs> What's that? Good morning. Yes. So thanks for coming on with us this morning. Um, your, I read your, um, your background and the work that you do, which really vast and it's four pages long <laughs> right here. Um, I tried to put some of it, some of the highlighted areas um, in your introduction today, but um, do you want to tell us, I know there's so many things we can talk about today, Jen. 
Um, and I know because you do so much specialized work, I wanted to take the time in this live stream to introduce you, um, get people familiar with the type of work that you do, how you got started, and maybe we'll touch up, touch on some of the things you do because some of it is pretty specialized. I know you were talking about um, one of your cases this past week, right before we got started. Um, and some of the things of what you do, why you do what you do. And I know we were talking this past week, you and I, like I wanted to also talk about um, why we do the work that we do, how we approach it with the science of the behavior that we know now and how we've just known how to do better over the years. Um, because I believe we both um, started off with using force uh, because that's what we knew. It's how right. we we're raised. Um, so, Jen, do you want to tell us um, a little bit about yourself and how you got started? Uh, starting goes all the way back to uh, middle school, high school. Um, so I'm from Hawaii, which is a small rock. <laughs> and there's not much you can do. It takes you to the island. Let's just say I was a very energetic child. My mom would say I was energetic, um, meaning that if I wasn't playing sports, I was getting in trouble. Okay, so keep you playing sports. Right. Well, in the meantime, so um, keep me playing sports or volunteering at the Hawaii Humane Society. I used to go to the Hawaii Humane Society all the time after school, walk the dogs, play with the dogs, um, watch the trainers, got involved with the trainers. They slowly let me creep in and, and help. My first big dog that I got as a child was from um, Hawaii Protective Dog Association. Both my parents were police officers, so they were able to get me a protection dog. Um, it's a wonderful dog. Went everywhere with me, off leash, rode alongside my bike, went to my friends' houses, played with their dogs. Big, do big difference in the dogs back then, right? We didn't have fences that kept them in. They were all very social. But... Um, while learning, I loved animals. I've always loved animals. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, then I wanted to be a marine biologist. Then I wanted to be a veterinarian. Then I joined the army. <laughs> <laughs> that sound, that's funny because I used to want to be a veterinarian. Um, and then I started into marine biology as well. Oh, and then I went to documentary filmmaking. So that's where we differ. <laughs> I had a chance to work at uh, Sea Life Park Hawaii um, as a, during the summer. Um, I, I've I love animals, all animals, but just training them was never enough. I always wanted to know the why and the how, and I knew. I guess I could say in my gut, in my heart, in my head, that little voice that tells you, "Why does this have to be so hard?" that there was something different, but I wasn't smart enough nor old enough to realize that there was something different. It took people that were much better than me to come along with science-based training years later. Uh, the smacking a dog on the backside or, you know, jerking that leash up and pushing their butt down while yelling sit at the top of your voice. Um, just seemed cruel. Yeah. But I did it because my dog had to be perfect. Because dogs need to obey. Correct. And yeah. especially our police dogs, they had to do it exactly the way we wanted them to do it or they would not stay certified. Um, if they didn't stay certified, they got euthanized because the training methods were so harsh, they weren't able to be homed with a civilian if you you know when when police dogs in the past retired they were euthanized really now really? with the difference in training now today's way today's with more science-based training coming in you notice the police dogs and even the military retired dogs they're adopted out to families because they're no longer considered dangerous do you remember 20 years ago when you saw a police dog that had a police dog vest on it, it said, danger, do not come close to it. You could never 
assume that the dog wasn't going to bite. Is that because how were they were trained? Yeah. Oh yeah. It was all physical. You got punished for doing wrong. Never praised for doing right. I mean, you did, but not like now, not like, not like today where we teach you what we want versus punishing you for doing wrong. And, um, that in itself is the whole, the whole difference in today's training versus training back then. And back then, Jen was how long ago? <laughs> 30 years. So I gave you myself. Um, so I've been, I've been working with dogs, working with dogs for over 35 years. Um, but you know, going back into the 15, 16 year old range, um, of professionally working with dogs over 20 years. So the training that training police dogs, um, now is different than what it was then. Oh, absolutely. Even the military dogs have, um, c come are completely different. Lackland Air Force Base has a puppy start right program for the dogs that are bred there and raised there. It's all um, science based. You know, I, I hate to use the word R plus or positive based training because most people don't understand the quadrant. Mm -hmm. They hear R plus, R minus, P plus, P minus, and they get the R plus but they don't really, they don't understand that it's adding a reinforcement and R minus is removing that reinforcement. They just hear R plus means they're going to be trained with treats. And that's not necessarily accurate. It's all, whatever that reinforcement is, is what you're adding. You're adding a reinforcer. You're, you're finding out what motivates the dog and adding the reinforcer. So Lackland, Bay, um, and I want to say it really started after <clears throat> Dr. Karen Overall was there, you know, she was hired as a contractor um, after the start of the wars to come in and work with dogs that were returning home from combat because they were finding that dogs were, ha dogs were suffering from PTSD also. So she s helped the, the military start and work through their PTSD war dog program. And I believe that she had a lot of influence on the puppies that were being raised and how they were being raised. And as the old breed of trainers or handlers go away, the newer breed of trainers are coming in with the mindset of this is how we started them as a puppy. Why are we not continuing down this road? I mean, I teach bite work and scent work all without ever hitting a dog. Uh, I couldn't say that 15 years ago. Yeah. I couldn't say that. I definitely couldn't say that 20 years ago. Um, I've punched dogs. I've hit dogs. I've never kicked a dog, but I, I have punched dogs in the head. And I look back now to what, you know, what I, what I know now versus what I knew then. And it makes me want to cry. And I have cried because if I knew then what I knew now, it would have never even been a concept in my mind, but that's what we learned. It's yeah. We're, we're what we know. We are what we know. Um, so, I mean, in, I've done similar, like I used to walk with the prong collar. Um, I used to walk and I've told this story several times, but I did what I knew, you know, um, I look at what's available um, and I saw the prong collars and I was like, well, I've never tried that yet. So let's see if the prong collar gets the dog to walk loose on the leash. Um, and I would have to pick up a tree branch every morning. I would walk my dog and switch him on the butt um, to positively punish the behavior of him pulling on the leash. It worked temporarily, um, but then the pulling on the leash would happen, which uh, would positively reinforce the behavior of me carrying the tree branch with me. So, but um, Jen, I mean, it's so good to hear 
that police dog training is is definitely different now than it was 20 years ago. I can say that to be factual, but not necessarily everywhere. Yeah. There are still some old school trainers out there that refuse to get behind the science because their methods work. And when methods work, it's hard to dissuade people from using those methods. <clears throat> I know a lot of um, what we call balance trainers that um, they're very loving. They very much care for their dogs. They, they very much want to see their dogs successful and they waver between the science and the um, compulsion. And with you saying that um, the aversives training with aversives work, that's the reinforcement once it works. Um, yeah, exactly. I recently had somebody ask me that they're like, well, we train, you know, we can train our animals with using force and it works and it happens quicker. And I was like, sure, it could. Um, and that's probably the reason why you why you do it. Um, but once this animal is adopted out and a lot of the animals I work with are exotic, undomesticated, um, how's that going to happen? How's that going to fare for that person once that animal's in that home? Oh, yeah, absolutely. As we, you know, you and I have talked about this many times um, and we've mentioned it back and forth. Dogs and horses, the only two animals that will let you beat them and call it training without killing you. Try that with an 800 pound walrus. Yeah. They'll eat you. Yeah. And and that is why <laughs> I love doing what I, I do. I love training exotics because, number one, you, you know, most of them are living in enclosures. They have limited choices. So I want to empower their world as much as I can. Um, I like working with them as well because there's always something new in my world of training, um, whether I'm training a baboon today, a parrot tomorrow, um, a wallaby in two hours, whatever. Um, but a lot of the animals that I train, you may able be able to use force once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It may never come back next to you. I'm not coming near that. I'm not going to touch that target because you're going to hurt me. Right. Right. And if the animal does come over and touch the target, it's usually, I mean, it, you can see negative reinforce effect of negative reinforcement on behavior. Mm -hmm. The animal, does the animal look excited to be with you or is it just standing next to you to escape, avoid a consequence of not? Absolutely. Is it shutting down? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stand here and look pitiful. You know, people are always telling me my dog look guilty. My dog looks guilty. So they knew what's wrong. I'm like, no, your dog's not guilty. Your dog is showing you appeasement behavior so that you don't beat it. Cause that's what it's afraid of. Yeah. And that's obvious. Yeah. It's obvious. <laughs> so Jen, tell us a little bit more about your work. Um, like I'm sitting here, I don't even know where to start with reading this. Um, I'm sitting here reading United States army military off police officer, retired master sergeant, senior military police officer, having multiple positions, <laughs> responsibilities and duties, team leader, squad leader, platoon sergeant, first military, military police investigator, military police canine handler and trainer, patrol supervisor, supervisor, U.S. Customs apprehension, okay, uh, <laughs> AWOL apprehension NCO. I don't even know exactly what all that means. Oh, well, the AWOL apprehension NCO, that was a part of when I was first got to Fort Carson, Colorado from Germany. I was assigned to the AWOL apprehension team. Basically, we went around and returned forcefully to the military those people that uh, went AWOL. Um, AWOL meaning absent without leave. Uh, we never went after somebody who was AWOL under 30 days. We always went after people that were AWOL over 30 days, which means they were DFR'd. Cause the military has all kinds of acronyms. Uh, DFR'd means dropped from roles, which means that you have an automatic felony applied to your name. Uh, if you're if you're gone from the military for more than 30 days in peacetime, you're DFR'd. If you're gone from the military over a specific number of days during wartime, you're DFR'd. You don't get a trial. You're you're DFR'd. You have a felony, and we go catch you. 
it was a fun job. So if I ever am uh, approaching somebody in a dark alley, I want you by my side. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us how, okay. Your work in the United States Army, how did it involve dogs? Um, so we had, especially when I was in customs, um, so I was stationed in Germany and we had dogs that um, sniffed out illegal narcotic contraband. So you're a soldier and you are, have been in Europe for three years or two years and you're returning to the United States. As a customs NCO, I would selectively pick uh, by random people's household goods to be checked unless you've been in trouble then you are automatically getting checked if you had any kind of non-judicial punishment or judicial punishment while overseas you can just assume your household goods were going to be checked so if you made that random lottery number and i showed up we showed up with a dog and we went through all of your stuff looking for narcotics and other um, items that you should not be returning to the united states with so that's one part of it. And then, of course, we had um, patrol dogs. And you're familiar with patrol dogs when you see local law enforcement, police dogs that uh, do bite work. And then, of course, we had explosive detection dogs. And the explosive detection dogs, or the EDDs, were used mainly overseas on base camps to ensure that um, explosives weren't placed in areas that they should not be placed. Interesting. Something most of us don't deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, definitely. Um, or don't think about, uh, you know, the, the, the necessity for an explosive detection dog not to be happy while working and wag their tail and lay down and hip hop when they've alerted is, is real. <laughs> they need to locate the explosive and freeze. Locate and freeze. Yeah. Sit, freeze. Don't move. Yeah. So you trained these dogs for this? Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Um, and then when did you get into search and rescue? So I got into search and rescue in 2015. I am a member of the Iowa Coalition of Independent Search and Rescue Handlers. I am on an amazing team um, where the women that are on this team... Um, are just wonderful. We have uh, Sherry that runs a Rhodesian Ridgeback uh, tra trailing dog and also a HRD dog. And she's got a phenomenal puppy that's coming up. Uh, we've got Tammy who runs both Live Find and HRD. We've got Marsha who runs uh, Live Find and HRD. HRD, human? Human remains detection. Okay. Um, myself, I have Live Find and HRD. And then we've got... Um, Robin, who also runs Live Find and HRD, and that's just on the search and rescue side. Um, Live Find, that's finding somebody that's alive? Yes, and so Live okay. Find Air Scent Wilderness is uh, Gracie Bell will find any human that I send. If I send her out into the woods, she'll find any human. It doesn't matter if you're the human that's lost. She's going to find you. We may have to redirect her to keep going. Whereas a trailing dog is going to be scent specific. They're going to take some of your odor, let the dog sniff it, um, have the dog discern the other people. Yep, this is not the odor. This is not the odor. This is not the odor. You're looking for this odor. And that trailing dog is going to find that specific person. <clears throat> and our team member, um, Sherry, is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Her and her dogs are very well trained very excited to work. You can tell that she, she loves doing what she d does and her dogs love doing what they do. Um, the dogs are all, yes, let's go. Let's go. No, there's no hesitation. There's no fear. There's no, there's no, um, Oh, do I have to go do this with any of our dogs? And so it's just really, it's, it's just an amazing team. And so they they took me under their wing knowing that I had other odor detection experience and said, okay, we'll give you a try. And so they gave me a try. They let me bring my dogs in and we trained with my dogs and both my dogs are nationally certified. And so, yeah, they, they allowed me into their world. 
Okay, I have so many questions for you. We have questions from people too. What kind of, okay, how do you determine dogs to get for search and rescue, to train for search and rescue? Um, you froze up a little bit, so I, I didn't hear that. Okay, I said, how do you determine um, what dogs you want to use for search and rescue? You personally. How do you pick your dogs? Well, I'm kind of a floppy ear person since retiring from the military. So um, I, I'm particular to the labs and uh, the high energy golden retrievers. Um, I currently have eight Labradors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I pick them by their enthusiasm. Actually, um, do you know David Brownell? <laughs> So I tend to use the Brownell scale. He's a former um, military police dog handler. He's also a kennel master. Current, well, he's currently in Iraq. He oversees some some of the contract kennels in in overseas. I use the Brownell scale quite a bit when I'm looking at it. I have modified it for my uses, um, but I, I when I'm looking at a puppy, that's what I use, and I typically have somebody else come with me because otherwise I'll take the whole litter. Sure. <laughs> oh. So, um, yeah, we were listening to a tail wag in one of the kennels. Oh yes. Uh, Grace, her, the kennels are open. I'm currently in the motor home right now because of the COVID-19 virus. Do so you want to explain our, that? Yeah. So, um, the motor home was donated to us, um, last year. And we have four kennels set up in here, um, kennels that we can travel as a team if necessary uh, to to seminars and or to um, a search if law enforcement calls us and says it's going to be a multi-day search. Uh, be prepared to be here on the long haul. We can actually go to that site as our team. We can, we can house four dogs in here comfortably and six people. Um, so right now I'm staying in here because my spouse is an RN and it works in infectious disease and works in and around long care facility, long-term care facilities. And so I can't go in the house right now. Yeah. Because I've been, um, just because I know, I mean, <clears throat> you're a level two member. So we've had group discussions and I've seen you living out here for like the past, at least week and a half to two weeks. I've been here a month now. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, but the good thing was, is that, um, when our team has to roll up and go, I know where I've, I've rearranged this thing so many times in the last month that I'm now down to a science of how to do long-term living in the motor home. There's a lot of people living in homes and campers outside of their homes because due to what their spouses do mm -hmm. or what they do for work. Um, so, okay, tell us about, um, can you tell us, this is from my curiosity too, I would love to come hang out with you for a week and work beside you for a week and just see what you do and how you do it. Um, if I did, I'm afraid I'd quit my job and ask if I could come work for you. Because <laughs> I find what you do very interesting. How can you tell us, I want to get inside your head of how you begin training or some of the steps in training for beginning search and rescue, um, live finds, um, HDR? HRD. HRD, okay. <laughs> um, how, how do you start training a dog for that? Well, so, okay, how I start might be different from everybody else, so I can only speak for self. Um I start with basic foundation obedience and you're going to hear the whole search and rescue world groan because so many people that work odor detection dogs say that odor detection dogs should not have obedience on them because it stops their drive and drive as we know is a construct. Uh, it does not stop their energy. It just makes sure that they pay attention to me. Uh, so I start with a lot of puppy play. Um, I use pup. Are you familiar with puppy culture? Yes. I use puppy culture quite a bit for puppy play and I teach them to retrieve toys and balls, which is natural as for a retriever as I just, I help develop it. 
Um, then I get the amazing women on my team to help me set hides, um, hides for once they're ready. So the first thing I do with an, with a HRD dog is teach the train final response or the TFR. Once I have a solid train final response, then I'll start working on a not, um, an inconsequential odor. The reason I work on an inconsequential odor such as birch or anise or cedar. Well, I don't use cedar. I use the birch sometimes, but mostly I use the anise that you do in nose work classes mm -hmm. is because I can make mistakes on that inconsequential odor and get all of that solid before I put the dog on a real odor on the odor that I truly want the dog to find. Um, that's how I do it. Now that may be different from how everybody else does it, but that's how I do it for live fine dogs. Um, my team, you know, the, the patience of my team members to play runaways with my dog and, you know, t teaching a live fine dog is not about you as the handler of the dog. It's about your helper. Your helper has to be amazing. The person that's hiding has to know when that dog gets to them to play with that dog and make that the most wonderful thing they've ever done is to find that person for the ninth time because <laughs> that person keeps getting lost. Um, and <laughs> making sure that the dog is doing what you want. You know, do you want a bark and hold? Do you want your dog to find that person, sit down or lay down and bark, 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 or, or stand there, bark, 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 bark? Or do you want that person to do a find refine? My dog does a find refine. They run out, they find the person because she knows I'm slow. She runs all the way back to me. She lays down on the ground, bark, 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 mom, bark, bark, bark. I say, show me. And she takes off running back to the person. And so she takes me all the way back to the person. Um, she may have to do back and forth three or four times by, before I get there because she's working, you know, hundreds of yards in front of me. She's working and probably doing what she loves. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Her her biggest downfall is, you know, a big puddle somewhere in the search area. She'll stop for a second, self-reward, and then go back to searching. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it, are you able to talk about any some of the work, like certain cases of some of the things you've done as far as a search and rescue. I should have asked you that before instead of putting you on the spot. Um, I am, uh, we have been given permission, our team members have been given permission for to talk about two cases that we were involved in. Um, one was um, a case in Northern Iowa. Um, a young autistic boy was missing. Um, our team deployed multiple dogs. Uh, we had the tra tra trailing dog. We had different HRD dogs. Um, the young boy was eventually found um, disarticulated uh, a couple months later. We were called on scene. I believe we arrived day three is when law enforcement brought our team, our different team in, different team members in, excuse me. Um, the trailing dog trailed from the house to the Creek, which is a rather large Creek, the different HRD dogs independently. So when we run multiple HRD dogs, we don't, if you ran your dog and your dog alerted, another dog might be brought in, but they have no idea what you and your dog did. So okay. they're brought in to confirmation. We call it a confirmation dog. Uh, we had multiple dogs confirm, multiple HR dogs confirm in the same general area that there was odor of decomposition. So you're specifically looking, are these like, you're specifically looking for decomposition at this point? At, at that point, because it was 72 hours post disappearance, we were looking for recovery. Okay. Um. The rivers were cold. It was in April. It, there was still ice on the ground. There was still snow on the ground. This is Iowa after all. Um, so when we left, we were sent home. The divers were in their dry suits, pulling, pulling the river, you know, arm in arm, but there were deep holes in the river. 
uh, we were, you know, we had the, we had the melt, the winter melt. We, then we had rains, then we had this, then we had that, then we had heavy rains. We had swift rivers. We were brought back in, I believe, and my dates may be off about a month later where the dogs, uh, the HR, HRD dogs, um, hit about two miles down the river. Um, in different locations in the low Creek bed, two miles down the river from where they, hit where they correct. So, yeah. uh, you know, we can only speculate remains were found, um, by some kayakers and dogs did give indications of locations. We can only speculate that where he may have went into the river, he may have gotten hung up on a branch or a bark or, or got into, into a, a hole and had silt cover him. Um, but that's all again, speculation, but a month or so down month or so later, he was, it, uh, there was odor of decomposition down two miles down river. And then um, another high profile case that our team worked was the Molly Tibbetts case. I don't know if I'm familiar. She was a young college student who was home and went for a run and was abducted, um, allegedly abducted because it's still going through uh, trial. Uh, the, and um, she was found murdered. Uh, our Pretty much our most of our team got called in for that. Uh, but when you get called in for assistance with law enforcement, you go where law enforcement sends you. They'll give you specific areas to search and you search those areas. We, um, we were unsuccess un unproductive in that search, um, but we were available for use, um, you know, by law enforcement throughout the entire, uh, search sequence. And it is currently in the process of uh, going through trial now. Wow. Okay. Um, what state was that? Iowa. Okay. So, it, all right. I have a lot of questions from you. And we have some questions from people that are watching this. Um, <laughs> well, I'm just trying to think about the work that you do and how would... Do you find it tough to go out on some cases where you're like, okay, here we go? Um, I think I personally am hopeful anytime that I get called um, that we will have a productive search so that we can give closure to the family. If it's uh, recovery, for example, or if it's a um, lie find, you know, have a productive search so that we can bring somebody home. Right. Um which that does happen. Yes. I mean, you know, you hear all the time live find or trailing dogs that have found somebody that's lost in the woods um, that have reunited them with their family. What, mo what a lot of people don't realize is that so many of the search and rescue handlers across the United States are all volunteers. We don't get paid for it. It's it's not a uh, job that we do. We spend thousands and thousands, and I'd say tens of thousands of dollars of our own money each year, training our dogs, keeping our dogs certified, uh, deploying at a minute's notice or 10 minute notice for any law enforcement agency that calls us. And it, it's non-compensated. Every once in a while, we may get a a police department that says, let, let us pay for your gas that got you here. Or let, when we got called to South Dakota, Dakota for the young girl, the nine-year-old <laughs> lost in the South Dakota, um, Black Hills, uh, the law enforcement put us in a hotel. You know, that was their compensation. They paid for our, our mileage and they put us in a hotel which was very nice of them. Uh, I'm not complaining whatsoever, but n we're not the people that do this are not po all police officers that are getting paid by the hour to go out on search. You get called in the middle of the night, you're up getting dressed and walking out the door with your go bag 
And this is a volunteer who may be working at Wells Fargo the next day. You know, kudos to you. I didn't know that was voluntary. Yeah, yeah. All the search and almost all the search and rescue handlers that you see out there are are doing it for the love of continuing to help, are doing it to help a family and because they have a desire to give back. I like you even more now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, and it's got to be it's got to bring you a good feeling to go out with your teammates, your dogs, knowing you're serving a purpose. Um, there's an end goal here and hopefully reuniting a family or bringing finding somebody who is uh, giving closure. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever search for criminals? I do not. Um, not with these dogs. Uh, we'll save that for the law enforcement dogs that have bite work on them. Okay. Okay. Um, we have been asked to search cornfields for criminals and we have declined uh, because my, my dogs will walk up to you looking for you and try to lick you in the face. I don't want them shot or hurt. Sure. Understood. Understood. Okay. Um, we've got a couple different dog trainers on here. Daphne. Um, ask if you, any underwater scent searches? Yes, we do underwater. Uh, we've done swift river, slow moving water. We've done ponds. We've done lakes. Um, that's not an issue. Can you describe that to me? What is underwater? How does that work? Underwater. Well, so, <laughs> um, th well it's mathematical. <laughs> the, when the body sinks, there are, bubbles that are released from the body there's a uh, skin that comes up um, there's odor that comes to the surface depending on the depth the temperature how much the body weighed when the body went in how fast the water is moving uh, you you have a mathematical formula that you look at for the body entered the water at this point this is the temperature this is the speed this is when the body will gas off and come back, float on its own. If it, if it's not hung up on something, this is, this is where we should start our search based on temperature and swiftness of the river and depth of the river. Um, Interesting. At 50 degrees at 18 feet with 160 pound body has a five second sink time with a 15 to 20 foot drift. And that's just off the top of my head. That's wow. not accurate. I'm just throwing that out there. That's the things that we have to look at. We actually have a table that we look at. Wow. So do you do, obviously you do continuing it. Well, you tell us about the work that you do because you travel all over the United States. Yeah. Um, I do continuing education myself. Uh, I take all kinds of seminars. I, I, I go to seminars. I teach seminars. Um, if you're not learning, you're stagnant, period. If you're not, you know, when I was in the army and I was a senior NCO, we get brand new soldiers coming out of basic and AIT, which is advanced individual training. And I would put them in charge of some of our training and some of my senior, more senior soldiers would go, why are you doing that? I said, because they got the latest and greatest. They just learned it. You know, you have to constantly be adapting and evolving and learning and trying new things, um, you know. Sometimes it, it's hard to think outside the box. Sometimes, um, like when I go to seminars to continue education, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Or, oh, wow, I never thought about that, you know. Or, oh, that's interesting. Well, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, I joined your level too. Uh, because it refreshes me and I learn. And I learn from everybody. There's not one person I don't interact with that I don't learn from. I either learn that I don't like that and I ain't ever doing that. Or I go, huh, let me try that. There's nobody that can't not teach me. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, some people are on here talking about SAR. What is SAR? S A R. SAR, search and rescue. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> There's okay. all types of search and rescue. I mean, um, 
you know, we run with the canine team. So we're all, you know, canine handlers, but there's mounted search and rescue on horses. Um, there's people that do aerial search and rescue. They fly. Um, so there's, there's all different types of teams out there that come together in a uh, search or recovery event that, that work together under the NIM system. NIM? Um, National Incident Management. It's a oh, okay. system that can go bigger or smaller based <laughs> on the needs of the incident commander. Okay. Um, Daphne posted this a while ago, and I remember reading about this, about there was a thought about training vultures to do cadaver searches, horses too. I remember reading about the vultures and I was just like, I want in on that. Um, <laughs> well, you know, to be honest with you, I do, when I'm out on a search, I do look to the sky to see if there's vultures overhead because they're a great indication of where we might want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if somebody was interested in getting in this field, Jen, like if I was 20 again, I would seriously consider this. <laughs> what do you suggest they do? I suggest that they locate or locate and find their local search and rescue teams from their own states or counties and ask to be an assistant. Tell them they're very interested in doing this and hang out with them. What will probably happen is they'll either be a hider or a go gopher for about a year while they learn how to do this, while they take, and if they're interested in canine, they'll have to take their canine certificate, their individual handler certifications for canine. So there's a difference between having a, a certified dog and having a certified human. Okay. So th they have to have both. Um, hang out with that local team, find out wh where are you needed on the team? What assets can you bring to the table? Oh, you want a canine? Well, we really need a cadaver dog, or we really need a live find dog, or we really need a trailing dog. Are you interested in any of those? And then start learning from those team members. So be a part of the team. Absolutely. Because if you're not willing to go hide in the wilderness um, for our dogs, or you're not willing to go lay a trail for our tracking dogs, then you're really only about yourself. Because as a team, we have to do that. Like that I'm, is so ho I'm horrible because I live so far out that I hardly get to see my trailing teammates because they're always training when I'm, when I'm, when I have clients, regular clients for my, my actual, my other business. Um, so I very, I, I get to get out there once in a while for them, but we need people that are willing to go lay those trails and we need multiple people. So the dog's not going, why are you always getting lost? I found you three weeks ago. Five <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, okay so if somebody and I'm just thinking if somebody were thinking about retiring is it from their current job is it too late for them to want or or somebody like me that is currently working and I wanted to get into something like this on the side is that a possibility absolutely uh, absolutely. I mean, I retired do. from the military before I started doing this. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. I don't remember what I said. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, and you're you're in Ohio. There's there's some very good teams in and around the area that you're in. Because I'm kind of interested in this, um, but I need to make sure I have the time. Yes, I mean, you do a lot of other things too. That you're like a lot of us. We have we're going a hundred miles an hour in five different directions all at the same time. Yeah, because it interests me. Because I want, I always want to learn more. <laughs> it's an area I'm not familiar with at all, um, but I love the type of training that can be done with the dog. Um, I'm interested in that relationship and the teamwork with the dog. Bzz plural. Yeah. Um, I'm sitting here searching through my mind of all the exotics that I work with that who might be a great candidate for this, <laughs> you know? Um, okay. So tell us Jen um, about canine census. So canine census is um, our nonprofit. Um, I am not the CEO. 
I am one of the program managers and I work in the program management of Back on the Block, which is a veterans um, organization for female combat veterans. And, but we, I'm also an instructor for Canine Census and Canine Census, we teach the other end of the leash. There's all kinds of organizations out there that tell you they're going to train your dog. Well, we want to train you. We want to work on modifying your behavior so that your dog has successful training and is able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So you're training the people. We're training the people. How to train your dog? How to train their dog. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and it's, it's mostly working dogs. Um, but we will work with pet dog trainers or pet dog people. Um, when they ask, what are you training the people to do? Mostly at this point with canine census, we're training odor detection dogs. Okay. We're either training explosive d detection dogs, narcotic detection dogs, uh, HRD dogs, um, live find uh, wilderness dogs. Uh, we have been asked to help the DNR train um, bat and bird detection dogs, bird, bat and bird carcass detection dogs for a study that is happening or going to happen at some point um, on the windmills because we have a lot of windmills in Iowa and we're trying to find out what's happening to the bird and bat population around the windmills. That interests me too. So if somebody's interested in getting into this, in addition to finding their local SAR, um, do they come to Canine Census as well? They can. We, we hand, we, um, right now we're doing a lot of online courses. Um, and Robin is running the lead on those on online courses. Uh, but we do have seminars. Um, all of our seminars up until June have been canceled this year, uh, due to COVID-19, uh, our in-person seminars, but our, we have not yet canceled our June seminars and I'm praying. Um, I'm just not, it's hopeful, but I highly doubt it. Um, and we have, we have some phenomenal trainers that are, um, that are instructors with canine census. We have Brad Dennis, um, who is the president and lead trainer for class kids for human trafficking. We mm. have Greg Cole. We have, um, our, our members of our team. We have Lisa Higgins from Louisiana. Um, we have Robin Grubel also from Iowa. Um, so we have, we have an amazing team that comes together. Um, Paul Martin out of Tennessee to, to give high, higher skills training from beginner all the way through advanced. And we're talking from full body searches to forensic searches for law enforcement. The more you talk about this, the more I'm fascinated with it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be checking out canine census. I'm just going to look through and see what I might want to be doing in my free time in another year. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you have okay. my phone number, so you can always call me or text me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, any other organizations that you have that you want to mention? Well, um, we do have the Iowa Coalition of Independent Search and Rescue Handlers, and we occasionally fundraise for that. Uh, if anyone is interested in, and what we use for that is for our continuing education and sometimes for gas um, to and from search scenes and, and training. Uh, it is, we, we don't, we don't push it. We don't publish it. It's just, you know, if anybody most of our fundraising comes from people that know us and our family members. Um, but that's out there. And then of course we have back on the block, which is our, a part of canine census. And all of what I've just mentioned can be found on the canine census website. Um, back on the block is dedicated to helping uh, female combat veterans with um, retreats family retreats, individual retreats, working dog seminars to bring your own dog. And we're going to help you train your dog to maybe you don't need a service dog, but you want to work in search and rescue. So we're going to help train you train your dog. Um, 
whatever the veteran wants is what we're willing to do. We have donkeys and and goats and mini donkeys and cows because it's a working ranch. It's you know seven hundred acres. Um, we have multiple ponds on the property, so we also do a lot of hides, uh, uh, source hides for HRD work. And then, of course, I have um, my own business with my employees. So, Okay. We've got about four minutes left. Can you tell us about, like I said, you have so many areas of specialty. I just wanted to take this hour and introduce people that follow the work that we do to your overall. <laughs> so I, um, I'm the owner and lead trainer for Kawa Farms Canine Training. Uh, Kawa means river. Um, it's Japanese, my, part of my last name. Um, so we train pet dogs, working dogs, and we do a lot of behavior modification clients. And right now we're, we have, we have a couple of different contracts with service dog organizations to help them train their service dogs at the advanced through the through any behavior modification and or the advanced tasks prior to placement such as go get my pills and go open the refrigerator, get me a bottle of water, bring me the bottle of water and my pills. The alarm clock just rang, go wake up your human, make sure they get out of bed. Um, go, you know, push this button to call 911. So advanced tasks at the end of the line, our foster based program in one of the organizations is wonderful. And then we, we pick up the dogs at the end and, and help them prepare for their life as a service dog. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I need to get to Iowa. <laughs> Anytime. Well, I you, know. well you're, you're supposed to be here. I know. I know. That's probably not going to happen at the time frame that we talked about. I know. I know. But we'll reschedule you. Yeah. Uh, my, our fosters were really excited to meet you. And, you know, I was excited for you to meet our whole team. But, you know, virus. Yeah. Well, we'll get through this virus thing and um, figure out ways around it. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if there's ever anything I can do for you in the meantime, even if it's something live via live stream um, until we reschedule. Because I have a, I have a um, schedule as well that sure. I need to take a look at and start rescheduling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that our, our June uh, seminars actually happen just because I'd like to see my team members again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm missing a lot of people here as well. Um, so people are really enjoying this conversation, Jen, and they want to have you back. Okay. <laughs> Would you come back on coffee with the critters with us? Absolutely. You know, I and love coffee with the critters. Yeah, yeah. I I see you on, on Sunday mornings and I appreciate you. I gotta have my coffee though. Yeah. Okay, so for anybody that wants to reach Jen, you can reach her at kawafarms.com. Um wait, that's your website. Your yep. email address is Jen at kawafarms.com. That is correct. <laughs> I pulled up your website prior. Um, you can also check out her website, kawafarms.com, and you can take a look uh, more at K9 Census, which I will be at k9census.org. Um, Jen, thanks so much for coming on with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of different things for just before we end. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. For those of you that are interested in the work that we do here at the Animal Behavior Center, um, we do workshops. We have an upcoming zoo workshop. Um, <laughs> we schedule. Um, we have a lot of different workshops coming up. You can take a look at our website, um, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. A lot of the work that we do, I would say 80% of the work that we do is via our live streaming services. We've been live streaming our services for over five years, probably closer to, closer to over six years. Um, we have our level one online membership, which is more for companion animals. And this is all focuses on understanding using applied behavior analysis with animals, the laws of behavior with animals. Um, so we have level two, which is more for professionals. Um, Jen's a member. Um, 
it's more for professionals, board certified behavior analysts, um, zookeepers, zoo workers, dog trainers, um, people who are just really interested in the field of behavior. Some people like species specific. Um, they don't want to see how this applies to all animals. They want to see how it applies to their pigs. We have the pig project, the parrot project, the deaf dog project. Um, let's see. Um, I think that's pretty much about it. So Jen, once again, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate you. I have a more, more appreciation and understanding and love of the work you do and oops, and the person that you are. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So when I hit in, Jen, we're probably, it's probably going to disconnect us. <laughs> okay. I'll talk I'll to you. Shoot you. Okay. I'll shoot you a message. All right. Bye. Thanks. See you, everybody.